the show where we share our favorite stories from Boston history. This is episode 52, A Year in Review. Hi, I'm Jake. And I'm Nikki. This week, we're going to celebrate our one-year anniversary with a look back at our favorite episodes. We'll also share some reflections on podcast productions and our plans for switching things up in the year ahead. But before we talk shop, it's time to take a look at what's coming up this week in Boston history. Monday is October 30th. After the Boston Massacre in March 1770, the British soldiers who stood accused of murder were afraid that it would be impossible to get a fair trial in the town of Boston. Newspaper accounts of the massacre, Paul Revere's famous engraving, and a propaganda onslaught by the Sons of Liberty all worked to turn the minds of the people against the accused. At first it seemed that no attorney would agree to represent them. Captain Thomas Preston, the officer accused of ordering his men to fire, was able to retain attorneys Josiah Quincy and Robert Ockmady, but both of them insisted that they would only do it if John Adams also signed on to the team. When an intermediary from Preston approached Adams, he would later recall, I had no hesitation in answering that counsel ought to be the very last thing that an accused person should want in a free country. That the bar ought, in my opinion, to be independent and impartial at all times and in every circumstance. The soldiers and Captain Preston were tried separately, and Preston's trial came first. Starting in the last week of October 1770, Adams would lay out a case that the mob had been threatening the British soldiers, goading them to fire. He would also argue that Preston had not issued an order to fire, and thus he could not be culpable for the ensuing deaths. In his opening argument, John Adams would lay out what is now considered a basic principle of American justice. In some cases, presumptive evidences go far to prove a person guilty, though there be no express proof of the fact to be committed by him. But then it must be very warily pressed, for it is better five guilty persons should escape unpunished than one innocent person should die. Indeed, one would much rather that twenty guilty persons should escape the punishment of death than one innocent person should be condemned and suffer capitally. Adams carefully used his right to challenge jurors, ensuring that the resulting panel was open to acquittal. He called 23 witnesses, while the disorganized prosecution called 15, who frequently contradicted one another. After a six-day trial, almost unheard of in its length at that time, the verdict came back on October 30, 1770. As the Boston Gazette and Country Journal reported, The examination of evidences and the pleas were continued from Wednesday, each day, the Lord's Day accepted, until Monday, when the judges summed up the evidences and gave the charges to the jury. The jury went out about five o'clock, and it is said agreed by eight. The court was adjourned till the next morning at eight o'clock, at which time they brought in their verdict. Not guilty. And Captain Preston was dismissed. The 30th was John Adams' 35th birthday, and one imagines that the acquittal was a pretty good birthday present. During the occupation of Boston, morale was low among the occupying British regulars. Desertion had become commonplace, especially after the British Army ran out of hard currency to pay soldiers' salaries. Brooke Barbier, our guest from episode 22, explains what happened when a deserter from the 14th Regiment of Foot was caught. Bostonians were on edge. Around 8 o'clock in the morning on Monday, October 31st, 1768, townspeople could hear drummers sounding the dead beat. It seemed to be coming from near Boston Common. And then, figures came into view. A young man dressed all in white appeared, ghost-like, at the top of Beacon Hill. He was followed by several soldiers as they all marched down the hill to Boston Common. The young man was positioned in front of a firing squad. Was this actually happening in front of so many people? The soldiers lifted their guns, aimed, and shot the man in white. They left his body for dead, right there in Boston's public park. His name was Private Richard Ames. His crime was desertion. Apparently, even the British soldiers didn't want to be in Boston. It was the first military execution in Boston. Ames was buried on Boston Common, where he fell. Wednesday is November 1st. An ad in the Boston Daily Times and Bay State Democrat advertised a new school that was opening in Boston on November 1st, 1848. Female Medical Instruction A class of females will be instructed in the theory and practice of midwifery by thoroughly qualified and responsible physicians in Boston. The course to commence Wednesday, November 1st, and continue three months, 
comprising systematic study, numerous lectures, and opportunity to acquire practical knowledge. Tuition $25, payable in advance. Board in the city, $2 to $3 a week. A number have already engaged to attend. Others wishing to are requested to send their names as soon as convenient. For further information, and for testimonials from eminent men, apply to Samuel Gregory. Although it started out as a three-month course in midwifery, the Boston Female Medical College would expand to offer a full medical education in 1850, and soon graduated its first class of female physicians. Over 300 women graduated from the school before it finally merged with Boston University in 1873. For more on the Boston Female Medical College, check out episode 18, where we profile one of its most notable graduates. There's a lot of buzz about voter fraud in our political discourse right now. Is there any validity to the criticism of you that you say things you can't back up factually? And as the president, if you say, for example, that there are three million illegal aliens who voted uh, and then you don't have the data to back it up, some people are going to say that's irresponsible for a president to say that. Is there any validity well, to many that? many people have come out and said I'm right. You know I that. I know, but you've got to have data you, to back that up. Let me just tell you, when you see illegals, people that are not citizens, and they're on the registration rolls. Look, Bill, we can be babies, but you take a look at the registration. You have illegals, you have dead people, you have this. It's really a bad situation. It's really bad. Despite the fact that voter fraud is practically non-existent, a large group of low-information voters continues to have a mental image of nefarious figures showing up at a polling place to cast a vote on behalf of a dead person, or of illegal immigrants impersonating citizens in order to vote. As rare as voter fraud is, that form of in-person voter fraud is almost unheard of. However, we do have at least one case of someone being caught red-handed in an attempt to cast fraudulent votes in person right here in Massachusetts. And we only have to look back as far as 1646. On November 2nd of that year, a man named McGill Smith became a freeman in Massachusetts. Becoming a freeman meant that he would have the full range of rights and responsibilities of a white, property-owning male citizen shareholder of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Among them, the right to vote. At the time, most elections in Massachusetts had moved away from paper ballots. Paper was simply too expensive to waste on voting so votes were cast using kidney beans. When it came time to vote for members of the Council of Assistants, each voter would drop a white or black bean into a box representing each candidate. A 1643 law said that the white beans manifest election, the black for blanks. On the very same day that McGill Smith was made a freeman, he was called on to cast the first vote of his life, and he may have been a bit too enthusiastic about it, he dropped three beans into the box for his favorite candidate, and he got spotted. Under the 1643 Massachusetts election laws, voting more than once was punishable by a fine of 10 pounds, which was half a year's earnings for the average farmer. Luckily for McGill, the general court had mercy on him. It is ordered that the fine of McGill Smith, for his putting in of three beans at once for one man's election, it being done in simplicity, and he being poor and of a harmless disposition, it is ordered his fine is suspended till further order from the general court. Friday is November 3rd. In last week's show, we talked about the praying Indians of Natick, those members of the Massachusetts tribe who decided to follow Minister John Eliot, converting to the Christian faith and adopting many European practices. We mentioned that at the outbreak of King Philip's War in 1675, they were forced into internment camps on Deer Island in Boston Harbor. Well, on November 3rd, 1675, things just continued to get worse for them. Whereas this court have, for weighty reasons, placed sundry Indians that have subjected to our government upon some islands for their and our security, it is ordered that none of the said Indians shall presume to go off the said islands voluntarily upon pain of death. And it shall be lawful for the English to destroy those that they shall find straggling off from the said places of their confinement, unless taken off by order from authority, and under an English guard. And it is further ordered that if any person or persons shall presume to take, steal, or carry away either man, woman, or child of the said Indians, 
off from any of the said islands where they are placed, without order from the general court or council, he or they shall be accounted breakers of the capital law printed and published against man-stealing. And this order is forthwith posted and published. The whole court being met, it is ordered that the country treasurer take care for the provision of these Indians that are sent down to Deer Island, so as to prevent their perishing by any extremity that they might be put unto for one of absolute necessaries. And for that end, he is to appoint meet persons to visit them from time to time. Despite this order to prevent their perishing by any extremity, the Native Americans on Deer Island suffered that winter from lack of food, blankets, warm clothing, and fuel. Of the 500 to 1,000 who were forced into captivity, less than 170 were still alive when they were released in 1676. Speaking of Reverend John Elliot, he arrived in Boston on November 4, 1631, on board the Lion. On the same ship were Margaret Winthrop, Governor John Winthrop's wife, and their son, John Jr. Their daughter, Anne, who was about 18 months old, died on the voyage. When the first family landed, the ship gave them a seven-gun salute, and the militia performed drills and fired volleys in their honor. This was just a year after the Winthrop fleet first arrived in Boston, a difficult year described by the partnership of the historic Bostons in their survival 1630 tour. During that first year in Massachusetts, home sweet home might be a burrow dug into the side of a hill, or, if you were lucky, a tent or ramshackle lean-to. There was no time to plant crops and no supply ships for seven months. Food was a meager diet of acorns, nuts, and whatever seafood could be found. Their welcome to the infamous New England climate was highlighted by the Boston Harbor being frozen solid for two straight months. Given the hardships of the preceding year, the celebration that met Margaret Winthrop is all the more surprising. Diverse of the assistants and most of the people of the near plantations came to welcome them and bring and send, for diverse days, great store of provisions, as fat hogs, kids, venison, poultry, geese, partridges, etc., so as the like and joy and manifestation of love had never been seen in New England. It was a great marvel that so many people and such store of provisions could be gathered together at so few hours' warning. Finally, Sunday is November 5th. Remember, remember, the 5th of November. And if you remember that, you'll remember that our very first episode covered Pope's Night in Boston. In our colonial period, Bostonians would commemorate the thwarting of the 1605 gunpowder plot against King James on November 5th each year. They would build floats with effigies of the Pope, the Devil, and other figures. Then gangs, or committees, from the north and south ends of town would hold competing parades, attempt to steal each other's floats, and get into general displays of fisticuffs. It was a drunken, violent, anti-Catholic annual party that everyone seemed to love. When, during our revolution, we were attempting to win the support of both French Canadians in Quebec and the French crown in Versailles, poking fun at their state religion no longer seemed like such a good idea. General George Washington's November 5, 1775 orders to the Continental Army encamped outside Boston left little doubt as to where he stood. As the commander-in-chief has been apprised of a design formed for the observance of that ridiculous and childish custom of burning the effigy of the Pope, he cannot help expressing his surprise that there should be officers and soldiers in this army so void of common sense as not to see the impropriety of such a step at this juncture. At a time when we are soliciting and have already obtained the friendship and alliance of the people of Canada, whom we ought to consider as brethren embarked in the same cause, the defense of the general liberty of America. At such a juncture, and in such circumstances, to be insulting their religion is so monstrous as not to be suffered or excused. Indeed, instead of offering the most remote insult, it is our duty to address public thanks to these our brethren as to them we are so much indebted for every late happy success over the common enemy. With that, we usually jump into our main topic, but this week we're going to do something a little different and reflect on our one-year anniversary, which is something we're actually quite proud of. 
Yeah, as we were getting ready for the show this week, we realized that our first episode came out on October 30th of last year, so sometime this week, we are having our one-year podcast anniversary. And this is going to be episode 52, so we're a year in and well over 50 episodes deep. So we thought this would be a great time to sort of look back at the year that's gone by, get off script a little bit, and also... At the end, we'll pose a question to you, our listeners. Uh, so I guess for everyone who's been held in suspense with that tension, the will they, won't they, that Sam and Diane vibe we have. We already did. We already did what? Well, then like Sam and Diane, we already did. <laughs> will they, won't they? <laughs> they did. They did. So we are a married couple. Uh, we've been together for... 13 years. 13 we, we years think. now. We're both bad at math. Uh, there is a blooper on the website where you can hear us try to do math in real time on the show. In 1993, a small bronze plaque was placed on the sidewalk. <clears throat> How many years after the fire is that? 39? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, wait. No. 41. Fif- 51? 51. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, We live in Boston's Hyde Park neighborhood, and we record out of the house here. Um, And I guess, interestingly, we're both transplants. Neither from Boston. I'm from West Virginia originally. I'm from Pennsylvania. So I think that being a transplant gives you a different perspective on a city or a place than somebody who grew up there would have. Uh, When we had Brooke Barbier on for episode 22, uh, she's an author who wrote a book about Boston and the American Revolution. She's also a transplant. I think she's from California. And it's a topic I wanted to explore a little more with her. And then the conversation went a different direction. But I do think that moving to a place as an adult or sort of an adult in my case, you explore a city's history, uh, you're not sick of all the stories and grow up going to all the, the museums and historic sites on field trips. So it's been fun to get to know Boston and now doing this show gives us an excuse to share the stories that we've learned or come across along the way. So I have a lot of fun because of that. And we've also enjoyed though, going to history sites and doing activities in the places where we come from. So I feel like then moving away from a place, you also get to kind of rediscover in that same way. So it's really best of both worlds. Yeah, you get to be a tourist in your own hometown. So I guess another thing that is probably pretty obvious is that we are not trained historians. Um, I think we probably each took a few history classes in college. And I actually uh, have not had a history class since my senior year of high school. Oh, oh I remember Should Professor I? Hilt so well. Should I reveal that? Is that a terrible thing to say? <laughs> well, I took some good history classes in college. World history since 1945. Professor Hiltz, if you're out there, I remember you well. It's just another thing that I feel is important to lay on the table as we're opening up with everything this week. There are a lot of great history shows out there that are hosted by academic historians. We're not that show. We try to do good research and give a factual show and hopefully an entertaining, engaging show. Uh, But we're not, neither of us have PhDs. Nikki apparently took some history classes in college. I took none. Uh, so, but we have library cards, we do have library cards and we're pretty good at online research. Um, and I did have some interesting, uh, history overlap in my day job over the last year, year and a half or so. Um, I don't think, well, maybe this came up in one episode. Um, I work for an organization called United South End Settlements, which is a 125 year old organization in the South end of Boston. And uh, we had our 125th anniversary this year. And so um, I did have the opportunity to do a good amount of research into the Settlement House movement and to learn more about, you know, where we come from as an organization. So the first Settlement House in Boston opened in 1891 in the South End. It was called Andover House, named for the Andover Seminary. And uh, I actually had a pretty unique opportunity um, to meet an individual whose grandfather was really um, involved, um, not so much in the founding of the house, but um, became a very close friend of Robert Woods, who was the um, founder and who ran South End House for several decades. So it was interesting to meet somebody 
um, who has such a close family connection to the founding of our organization. So it was kind of a unique opportunity to do some uh, you know, personal interview research. And then we did put together a history exhibit on um, the relationship between settlement houses and the South End community and how um, those two uh, entities, if you will, have shaped each other and responded to each other over the years. Um, we worked with a historian, which was some really great advice we got from um, Abigail Norman at the Elliott School, who had been telling me about her experiences uh, prepping for their 340th anniversary. Um, so she clearly had a, a lot of experience in this area. Um, we actually worked with Russ Lopez, who is a historian and author in the South End, uh, has some great books out there, hope to actually have him on the show at some point, um, which Russ, if you're, if you're listening, that may be a surprise to you, but um, I'll come for you soon. And then earlier this year, you were also unexpectedly put in the position of being a Harriet Tubman expert. It was unexpected. Yes, very much so. But when the news broke that Harriet Tubman could be the new face of the $20 bill, surprisingly, um, through my role at United South End Settlements, I somehow emerged as an unofficial expert on all things Harriet Tubman because we operate out of the Harriet Tubman house. So I think when people were Googling for Harriet Tubman, Boston, uh, we were what came up. So I did get to do um, a few interviews. I got up really early one morning um, to be on a radio show. And then I actually got contacted by um, the mother of two children who were being homeschooled in California. And I only share this story because it has a, a pretty funny twist, I would say. They um, they reached out. They wanted to interview me because they were doing um, reports on Harriet Tubman. And I thought, well, I mean, they're in like third grade. So I feel like I could probably answer a third grader's questions about Harriet <laughs> Tubman. Um, but they were really uh, tough and on point. And so one of their questions was, you know, could you tell us how the Emancipation Proclamation affected the economy of the antebellum South? And I was like, well, yes, I can. That's actually the easiest question you've asked. I can answer that one. I can't really answer the others. So um, through my guilt, I, I found them a real Harriet Tubman expert, and there was a happy ending there. So pointing out again that we are not historians, but we do have some related history experience. We used to have a tour company, a walking tour company here in Boston uh, for, th was it three seasons? Three seasons, yep. We operated for three seasons, and we did what we considered to be sort of offbeat or off the beaten track tours of the North End, the Back Bay, and Beacon Hill. And after that... Um, then we wanted our free time back. Then we wanted our free so time back. So we had back. a great subsidized hobby, um, but eventually wanted to reclaim our nights and weekends. And then when that wrapped up, I repackaged the Back Bay Tour as a lecture, a sort of a one-session class for the Cambridge Center for Adult Ed. Um, so I am a history teacher. Sure. But only in the very loosest sense, in the same sense that you're a Har Harriet Tubman expert, I'm a history teacher. <laughs> and I guess as long as we uh, had diverged into settlement house history, I will tease that if you're interested in settlement houses, we will have a a long mention of Denison House, a women-founded and led settlement house in the early 20th century in next week's This Week in History. So then after we stopped doing the tours, I think some time passed and we kind of got that itch again. And, um, you know, we're interested in doing some volunteering. And, you know, I, I feel like I kind of started to miss um, giving tours. And so we ultimately, last summer did some docenting and volunteer tour guiding at the Shirley Eustis house in Roxbury. So one hot summer, July, probably maybe August day, we're sitting around in sort of the guide bullpen. Nobody's out and about coming to the museum because it's so hot out. And I don't even know how we got on the topic, but we were back and forth on what we could do with all these history stories we had. We must have been talking to some of the other docents about some of the funny stories we've learned over the years about Boston. And we said, well, how can we share these? And there was just like the moment of... A, Eureka! A, yeah, a bolt from the blue. 
we should have a podcast. And we pulled out a notebook and just right off the bat, we wrote down, I want to say probably probably 20 to 50 topics. Yeah. Okay. Well, over the course of the day, they really came. Yeah. We had a solid list when we got home. So we took that list at some point, we transferred it into a spreadsheet and then we went off and did some research. How do you start a podcast? What tools do I need to start a podcast? How do you get in iTunes? Lots of sort of basics we had to figure out. Went out and researched microphones. We might get ourselves an upgraded microphone for uh, uh, Christmas this year. Actually, that's a Christmas gift to our listeners. Right. So all that research took some time. The season ended for the, the Shirley Eustace house. And I think we were ready to start recording at probably the end of September or beginning of October last year. And we picked October 30th as the launch date. And we announced it. But then we had to record some episodes. And it took forever to get it right. Um, I think the first episode that aired, we probably recorded and discarded at least three or four times. At least, yeah. We were mad at the world by that point. We were (laughs) mad at each other. We were mad at our software. We were mad at our computers. But it was a good experience in terms of working out how to record this podcast. So I guess... Drawing the curtain aside, this is what it looks like these days. On a good day, again, we record out of our house in Hyde Park. So I, Jake, co-host, will go to the basement of our house. And on a computer in the basement, I'll plug in my microphone and I host uh, the recording software we use. And then Nikki will sit in the living room, plug in a microphone up there. And then, uh, you know, we'll get paused multiple, multiple times throughout any episode with a motorcycle driving by or the dog clank, clank, clanking around the house. (laughs) Or the next door neighbor and his leaf blower or whatever uh, background noise makes its way in. There's a lot of dog grunts and groans that don't make it to the final cut. Again, check out the website bloopers. I do have at least one or two bloopers (laughs) featuring our dog, Duke. (laughs) And two ships of war kept up a constant fire on our men. (laughs) (laughs) Honey, you were doing so good. (laughs) There's a cow in here. So we're... Part of what we're working on right now around the time of this anniversary is trying to tighten up what that sound is like. So... So right now we are under a blanket. In the basement, sharing one microphone. It's kind of hot. There's a lot of creaking. (laughs) (laughs) So the reason we're in the same room huddled under this blanket is twofold, I guess. Number one, I've read that if you stick your head under a blanket, it cuts down on the reverb and gives you a cleaner sound for recording. So that's half the story. And I think last week did have a cleaner sound. So there's some truth to that. Yeah, go back, check out episode 51. I think it's our cleanest sounding episode yet, or at least the, the cleanest one in a long time. Uh, the, the second half of that is that we're sharing a microphone huddled under, under this blanket. And the reason we're sharing a microphone is because we've had recurring issues with the service we use for uh, recording our podcast. They had a, a long service outage and they've been working to resolve some bugs that made it almost impossible for us to record from different rooms and that have also made it so we can't have a guest on recently, which we really enjoyed the one guest that we've had. I think we'd like to go with a lot more guests in the coming year. I just got an inquiry uh, yesterday from a publisher who wants to send us a galley. I'd like to have that author on. We'd Publishers, write- if you're listening... Don't even ask. Just send the galleys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Podcast at hubhistory.com. Send us an email. We'll give you the address. Send us the galleys. But and we will host your author just as soon as our software allows it. Exactly. Now, you can probably hear the difference between this show and most of our shows. Most of our shows are very tightly scripted. We sit, we research a topic, we write out a script. We deliberately this week decided to try to do things a little more conversationally. 
Uh, you may or may not notice there's still going to be some edit points throughout this conversation as we sort of lose the train, train of our conversation, have to restart. But I think that's a direction we'd eventually like to take the podcast in if we could get better at it. So we have a, a scripted show, takes time through the week to put the script together, to do, do the research, write the words. We sit down and record. I'd say on average, we probably have a half hour podcast, a half hour episode likely takes us about an hour and a half to two hours to record once you cut out the fact that I can't say words very well, especially the word Massachusetts, which turns out to be a problem for a podcast about Boston. So we end up with a recording that's somewhere upwards of 90 minutes most of the time. That then will take somewhere around three hours, sometimes a little bit more than three hours to edit down into a useful length. So choosing to leave the tour guide industry and start a podcast to reclaim our free time has been met with modest, limited, really not much success success at all, I would say, no. (laughs) So though we haven't been totally successful at reclaiming our free time, you did find some recent data about how successful we are as podcasters. We're a very amateur podcast, very DIY. And a lot of the the podcasts that are household names are very big. You know, you look at a a serial podcast or Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, they get millions of downloads every week. I looked at a June 2015 study. It was the most recent one I could find to try and tell us a little bit about what the average podcast is like and then how we stack up against that. So at the time, the author found that there were 206,000 podcasts in total on iTunes, about 60,000 of which were active in any given month. And then the pull quote from that article was, a typical podcast ran for six months and 12 episodes, at two episodes per month, before going inactive. So that's where I think we should pat ourselves on the back about going for 52 episodes in a year. Every week. Every week. So if that's the average podcast, I wanted to look at how we do. So this morning I went through our podcast hosting software and I pulled out our download numbers to try and compare what we do to the average podcast. So for us, uh, each episode gets about 300 to 500 downloads in the first month it's out. There's a podcast about podcasting called The Feed, which is put out by a company called Libsyn, and they do a lot of statistical analysis of sort of the podcast market, and they find that the median podcast episode gets 194 downloads in the first month. So that puts us solidly in the top half. Now, that does get skewed a little bit by podcasts where there's never any downloads. Exactly. So they find that the vast majority of podcasts get less than three downloads Ever. Like not even your mom right. would download it, which I don't know that either of our mothers downloads. She has commented. But my, I think my sister does. My mother has commented. She's a, at least listened once. Hi, Judy. Angie. Love ya. So this Libsyn outfit actually accounts for that. They throw out uh, the all those podcasts that have less than three downloads, and then they throw out the ones that are in the top one half of 1%. And they get an adjusted mean. And that adjusted mean is 2,620 downloads. Uh, to get into the top 10% of all podcasts, you have to have 5,000 downloads in the first 30 days. So while our. But you know, 76% of all statistics are made up. So we can just go with the one that works for us. <laughs> so then, for anybody who's curious, uh, today we're recording this on October 28th, 2017. And as of this morning, our podcast had 37,283 total downloads. Our most popular podcast remains episode two, which skyrocketed out to the front after about a month uh, of being out there. Suddenly it got this resurgence and downloads spiked, and it's sitting at 1,803 downloads. And we have no idea why. I assume somebody shared it in a class about Cotton Mather. I have no idea. It was our episode. If it was you. (laughs) 
right Let into us the know. podcast. <laughs> podcast at hubhistory.com. And for the love of God, share some more. Clearly it works. <laughs> so should we talk about, you know, some of our favorite episodes? Yeah, why don't we look at some of the ones that we enjoyed making or some that we found rewarding, some that were memorable to us. Uh, what was one of your favorite shows? Um, I think my favorite was about the Grimka or Grimke sisters, which was kind of one of those quirks where the internet did not yield a definitive pronunciation and we just had to make a call. Um, if anybody knows if it's Grimka or Grimke or, um, or Grimk, we could um, appreciate that knowledge. So my favorite episode, favorite quote, but I ask no favors for my sex. I surrender not our claim to equality. All I ask of our brethren is that they will take their feet from off our necks and permit us to stand upright on the ground which God designed for us to occupy. How about that? OG nasty woman, Angelina and Sarah Grimka Grimka Grimke. For me, I guess one of my favorite episodes to research actually turned out to have a very lukewarm at best reception with the audience. We actually actually did a two-part episode on pirates and pirate history in Boston, episodes 34 and 36, where we got to read all kinds of fun pirate stories up and down the New England coast. The story ranged from Boston Harbor to London to the Indian Ocean. We had hangings, we had gibbetings, we had... I mean, to be honest, they're fabulous episodes, and we do not know why they never got traction. Yeah, I thought that was going to be our breakthrough. I even bought uh, Facebook ads to promote one of them, and they just never went anywhere. They got a very average number of downloads, and I was pulling numbers today, and they didn't have great engagement on social media. I just don't know what happened. I thought everybody loves pirates. But apparently the Venn diagram of people who like pirates and people who like podcasts has a very slim sliver in the middle. So we're just saying, if you haven't listened yet to the two pirate episodes, I mean, I don't know what you're waiting for. So then there are shows that, I don't know if it's if it's favorites, but definitely leave an impact, but then are kind of hard to research. And, um, you know, there are topics where I think we kind of struggle on how to present things in a not overwhelmingly sad or negative manner. And then we also struggle sometimes with historic language and what language we are willing to use and what we're not. For episode 27, I researched the history of two enslaved women who were executed in colonial Massachusetts, uh, one in the 1690s, one in the 1750s. They were both executed by fire. They were burned at the stake. So when I started into that research, it was almost um, just the sensationalism of the execution by fire that drew me in. But it was a very hard episode to research as you get into the details, not only of just the violence of their deaths, but the injustice, I guess, is the best word of the situations they were in and the the way they were tried, that the fact that that punishment was reserved for women legally and practically it was reserved for black women. To protect their modesty. Right. So everything about that episode was tough. Every re- Every document I pulled up to read I felt like I needed to go for a walk afterwards or like take a shower. They were just really rough in terms of the subject matter. And it was also, as Nikki was saying, one of the topics where it was really rough to figure out how to negotiate the racialized language of the time and how much of that we should or shouldn't quote directly. In the end, we basically left it all in. We had a little disclaimer at the top of the episode, um, And we have since then, I think, a a few more times used some of that language on podcasts. But it was a tough decision to make how much to to quote that directly or to 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 try and sanitize it in some way. And then you also had the Coconut Grove episode, which I don't know. I, I feel like I maybe have chosen 
happier <laughs> topics. Although I think I actually selected the coconut grove and then kind of dictated that you did it. So <laughs> I think is how that went down. Uh, that sounds kind of familiar. <laughs> um, yeah, that was also, again, just because of the level of tragedy, like the scope, the scale, 492, I think people were killed in just moments in this this nightclub fire. And I'd always known it as something that happened in Boston history. I knew the basic outline, but I didn't know the details. And you start reading the details of people's deaths and um, fire inspectors' reports, coroners' reports, witness statements. Um, it was really, de- really depressing. Uh, and, was... and though it's not like much of a consolation, at least with that story, I think there was pretty immediate change. For the better, in terms of... A fire codes. Yeah. I mean, businesses were shut down right away until they made changes and reopened. Yeah. Um, so that's a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel of that story, I would I would suppose. But I would say also that I have not learned my lesson, apparently. I'm right now researching for an upcoming episode, uh, a story that involves the deaths of... The death deaths and violence toward uh, a number of really small children in Boston. Uh, so I continue having dark <laughs> topics <laughs> to research and, and write about. So that's... That one will probably have a disclaimer on it too. Yes, I've already yeah. written the disclaimer. So not, not a favorite episode, but I do have also a favorite person who emerged like not at all as a known historical figure, but in the episode on the police riots there was that description of the one woman who volunteered and she directed traffic in her opera gloves and feather boa. I wish I knew more about that person. Yeah. I don't even remember if she was named in the episode. I she was not. I don't think she's named in the records of history. She was a, an anonymous, like lone female volunteer. Yeah. I could see why. Maybe a descendant of the Grimkeys. Could be. Although they didn't have children. So probably not. No. <laughs> <laughs> so a- a- along with the shows we're very happy with. So there are, are shows that were our favorites. There are shows that we were proud of working on, even though they were tough topics to tackle. There are also a few shows that I'd like to go back and visit again. Nikki, do you ever go back and listen to the first handful of episodes? Nope. Don't do it. <laughs> I listened now to the first one, two, three, four, five episodes, and it's pretty painful. We were obviously still working out how to read on microphone. Uh, we also were very much trying to to work out the right balance of how much detail, how much research, how much material should actually go into each podcast. So there are definitely a few that I would like to revisit one of these days, whether that's in the second year or beyond, I'm not sure. But like, for example, our very first episode was on Pope's Night in Boston, the uh, long-standing anti-Catholic celebration, aka riots, that Boston observed on November 5th each year. Um, we did an episode on that. It was okay. We've stumbled across a lot more material since we recorded the episode. And when I look back, I feel like there was a lot more detail that could have been put in so maybe one of these days that would surface again and you also would like to do the molasses flood again yeah i feel like we have the same i I have the same reaction if i go back and listen to the molasses flood now i think that whole episode is about 15 minutes or so including this week in boston history so that just shows that we we hit a surface level telling that story i think there's a lot more to that story and we could get more into when I when I look at our scripts more recently, we do these readings from primary sources. We often stumble terribly over the readings from primary sources. The language is really hard to read. And often it is not meant to be read out loud. I except will say. Joseph except Warren. for Joseph Warren. <laughs> and we have definitely learned the difference between text that is meant to be read and text that is meant to be read out loud. And, and Joseph Warren's text, like, you can just get a sense of how powerful of an orator he must have been. And it just flows off the tip of the tongue in a way that even famous orators like uh, Edward Everett 
don't flow off the tip of the tongue the way Joseph Warren did. No, he, and, and a rabble rouser. Yeah. Like it's that kind of flowing off. Like it, it, it evokes the passion. Um, it really pulls it out of you. So suffice it to say, that is a gift that we have not mastered. <laughs> and looking back at the first few episodes, we definitely hadn't mastered them back then. What's interesting, though, is both of those episodes are on our North End tour. And I feel like when we started the podcast, we started with stories that we had already researched and um, really had already drafted, which I think made it easier for us to get started, but did not then prompt us to do a deeper dive. And I think that's when you start to see the, sh- the, the episodes getting longer, the stories getting more detail, is when we had to start researching things from scratch. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, even now, if I go back and, and start pulling material that I know I covered on one of my tours, I'm probably not going into as much detail as if I was researching that now. Cause I'm not going, I'm just going back to an outline or to notes I already had. I'm not going into primary sources and reading historians' opinions. I'm just going back to notes that I had from a, from a tour once upon a time. Yeah. So that's hopefully something that we can improve over the coming year or years, hopefully we will learn to write sentences that are meant to be spoken out loud uh, instead of writing sentences that sound great in your mind. And then you trip over the words when you speak them, which I struggle with daily. Yeah. We do have a, a lot of tongue twisters that inadvertently, because when you're writing, you want to be like alliterative and like fancy. And then you're like, she sells seashells. Blech. And you learn the power of short declarative sentences. I write these paragraphs with 17 subclauses in each sentence and a semicolon and three commas. And you never get a ch- You're exhausted. You're winded by the time you get done saying the sentence where you have to just stop and catch your breath for two minutes before you can go on and speak the next sentence because you don't write in short declarative sentences like Joseph Warren would. So that's one thing we'll be doing differently in the year ahead. And we've already discussed that we'd like to, you know, get our tech up to speed and uh, incorporate more guests. Um, We have also been talking for a long time about actually doing a movie review. Um, But I'm not going to I'm not going to say on what movie because I don't want people to watch it ahead of us. So there's a little bit of a teaser for a year two. So we've talked a lot about doing this movie review and whether it would fit into the format of our podcast. So if we go that route, it'll obviously be something a little different. It opens the door to other different styles of show. So if anybody out there has suggestions on something other than just a a narrative of a historical story from Boston history, and you think it would be a good idea for our shows, you should, of course, write in with that podcast at hubhistory.com. So along with getting our tech back on track and being able to have guests on the show, we also have as a goal improving the sound quality. Uh, Hopefully we've made some strides in that direction already. We're going to keep working on that. Also, we'd like to be a little more conversational. You can see this episode is an experiment toward that end. Uh, Maybe we'd like to be a little more scripted than this, but still have a little bit more of a conversational style. One thing I'm hoping to do in the the year ahead also is uh, introduce some bonus episodes. Now we have 52 episodes in the can, uh, a lot of great material out there. I think from time to time when there's a theme in the news or a historical anniversary coming up, maybe I'll take one of those old episodes off the shelf and re-release it into the feed with a new introduction and just say, hey, here is an episode about pirates, because I know none of you listen to the episode about pirates. And we can have that as a bonus episode along with our uh, normal shows during the course of the week. We're also considering um, a pretty significant change to the show format, because now that we've podcasted for a year, we've done a year's worth of This Week in Histories. And, uh, you know, while we can continue to mine and find more events and historical anniversaries, We've tapped out the good ones for sure, and we're wondering if we should switch to a format that before our narrative, we're talking about, you know, historic sites in Boston and nearby areas, maybe highlighting events that are coming up that people who are interested in Boston history would be interested in going to. 
Um, so we may uh, experiment with a few episodes in that format, but we do welcome any feedback um, one way or the other, or again, suggestions about how we could switch up the format of the show. So that's the big question we teased at the top of the episode. Should we keep This Week in Boston History? Is it time to move to a different format for the show? Let us know. Twitter, Facebook, or write in podcast at hubhistory.com. Is it time to talk about the iTunes reviews? Sure. So every week when we wrap up the show, you ask everybody to go to iTunes and review the podcast. Why do we do that? Well, first of all, we don't have that many reviews. I think the last time I looked, we had two iTunes reviews. The number of reviews and ratings are something that iTunes weights heavily in deciding to feature or promote a podcast or not. And I'm not an Apple Podcasts listener. Nikki isn't an Apple Podcasts listener. So you might wonder why we focus so much on iTunes, on Apple Podcasts. Uh, again, going back to that statistical analysis of, of podcast listening, somewhere north of 80% of all podcast listeners listen on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. So it is important for us um, to get reviews and ratings on iTunes. So that's why we have so much of a focus on iTunes and iTunes reviews in our usual sign-off at the end of the show. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at podcast at hubhistory.com. We're Hub History on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Or you can go to hubhistory.com and click on the Contact Us link. And while you're on the site, hit the subscribe link and be sure that you never miss an episode. If you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, please think about writing us a brief review. It is still the best way to help others discover the show. That's all for now. We'll be back next time with a show about radicals Ezra and Angela Haywood. That's Angela and Ezra Haywood. <laughs>